You know that feeling when you've launched a site and it's in the wild and you're scrolling around admiring your hard work? Some nicely chosen line heights, fast loading typography, some good expand and collapse functionality to make navigation easier on mobile. And then you find something like this. And it makes you want to scream. We put a lot of work into our code to make sure it's responsive. We design scalable components. We implement special navigation menus, carefully optimize our landing pages, linearize our content. We make SVG icons that are crisp at any resolution. But then you hit that pricing details page, and the table just doesn't want to play nice. It is, it's not every time. It's not all the time. Sometimes content fits just fine. Tables are flexible elements. But other times, things just go sideways. And it feels like we don't have any control. Tables. Some days they just make you want to rage quit. Am I right? Some of our frustration comes from moving from a big screen, where we have a lot of horizontal space, to a narrow one. So today, I'm going to talk about techniques we can use to change our tables to make better use of the vertical space available, flipping our tables from wide to tall. And because some of our frustration comes from using tables in inappropriate ways, before we talk about flipping tables, I'm going to look at whether or not we need them at all. I'll start by going over what tables are good for so we can examine when we should and shouldn't use tables. Next, I'll do a brief overview of the HTML markup that we use to build tables. Good markup is a better experience for non-visual consumers of our data, like screen readers, but it also gives us more to work with when it comes to styling and transforming our tables. Then I'll cover how we can communicate that structure visually, making it easier for our users to understand what we're trying to tell them or find the data that's most useful to them. From there, I'll talk about how we can make those design decisions into CSS. I'm sure this will be review for a lot of you, but I hope I can introduce you to a few new tricks. After we have a better understanding of the underlying design and coding decisions that go into tables, we can start to look at techniques for adapting them to smaller screens. A little bit of housekeeping before I start. First, I need to apologize to TransLink, Shopify, and BCIT. I totally faked those examples. I picked those sites because I knew they had good responsive templates to begin with, and it was easier for me to break one thing on a site that was working well than it was to fix everything except for the table on a site that was already broken. If there's anyone here from those companies, thank you for being a good sport. Second, most of this talk uses an example based on hockey data. Don't worry, you don't need to understand anything about hockey to understand my examples. I haven't seriously watched hockey myself since before my local team updated their logo. <laughs> it's just sports people really like their statistics, and they make a lot of complicated tables. And I wanted a complicated table for my example. If it helps, hockey is like soccer, only for countries where the grass is covered by snow in winter. <laughs> the first two columns of the table are pretty simple. They're the players' names and where they typically hang out. In soccer, players get points for manipulating a ball into a net with their feet. In hockey, players get points for manipulating a small piece of rubber into a net with a long stick. That's what the next three columns are. Goals are how many times the player has scored. Assists are how many times they help somebody else score. And points are a combination of the two together. Finally, in soccer, if a player breaks a rule, the penalty is to get kicked off the field. In hockey, a player has to go sit in a little box for two minutes while their team tries desperately to keep the little piece of rubber out of the net while short a person. If they were adults, we'd call these timeouts. Or if they were kids, we'd call these timeouts. But since they're adults, we call these penalty minutes. Of course, the real table is much longer than this. A typical team has 20 players on it, but I've only got so much space on the slides. So is my example a good example? When is it appropriate for us to use tables? This is a decision that you should be making based on the content and what you think your users want to get out of it. Ask yourself, when they look at this data, what kind of questions will they want to answer? It's table data if they're asking questions that indicate they want to sort it. Questions like, which player scored the most goals? Or who spent the longest in the penalty box? It's table data if they're trying to compare values, asking questions like, which of the Sedin twins scored more goals? Or which center had the most assists? 
If your users are trying to answer questions that require cross-referencing to find a specific value, it's also good table data. Maybe they're trying to find out, do players with lots of points spend less time in the penalty box? And it's table data if they're using the data to make calculations. This is a really nice table because it tries to guess which calculations the user wants and provides the answers. Answers to questions like, who has the most goals and assists? And how long does the team spend in the penalty box? Or maybe they're asking a question that requires all of the above. With a full roster of 20 players, if I want to know if left-wingers score more than right-wingers, I'd have to sort and cross-reference my data to make my calculations before I could perform my comparison. But it would be easier because the data's in a table. When should I not be using tables? Don't use tables for things you want in a column. This is not a table. This is a heading with a list. Don't use tables for things you want in multiple columns. This is also not a table. This is also a heading with a list. And we can achieve the same effect with CSS columns. It's also not a table if you want to put something next to something else. On a very basic level, this is a float. On a less basic level, Nicole Sullivan has created a great reusable CSS pattern for a fixed width thing on one side and some flexible content on the other side. If you've ever wanted to rage quit over a clearing problem, check out the media object. None of these bad use cases are about the content. They're all about how we want the content to be laid out. So don't use tables for layout. Got it? Tables are good for comparison, manipulation, finding precise individual values, or providing context to make or understand calculations. Tables are bad for layout. It's wrong, and when you try to make them responsive, you're going to have a bad time. Oh yeah, we're totally not done with the GIFs. My example table already has a lot of visual styling on it to help communicate how it's structured. Let's look at how to build that structure into HTML. This will give us a lot more to work with when we try to start to code the styles. The table tag wraps the table content, just like a UL wraps list. The first valid element is a caption. It displays outside of the table, but it goes inside the table tag. The next element that goes in a properly structured table is the column groups. This is kind of an obscure element, and it's not good for very much. I'll talk about why that is in the styling section, but we can use it to put a background color on a column, so we're going to use it here. Next comes the table head, table body, and table footer elements, and you use them for pretty much what you'd expect. But you might not know that you can have multiple table bodies and table footers. Most tables don't get this complex, but if they do, Multiple table bodies can be super handy because you can use them to put anchors throughout the content. For now, our hockey table only needs one of each. Now let's talk about what goes inside each of these elements. Inside the t-head, t-foot, and t-body is a tr, a table row, with a combination of th, table header, and td, table data elements. By default, the th tags apply to columns, but you can use the scope attribute to make them apply to a row like they do in our player names. TH and TD tags can also have multiple attribute, can also have the attributes call span or row span, which makes them span multiple columns or rows. In the bottom left, the table cell that says team total is actually a heading with a scope of row and a column span of two. In addition to those special attributes, any of these elements can have classes applied to them to help with styling. I felt a little awkward including the section in the talk for such an experienced audience. So can we do a short poll here? Can you raise your hand if you've learned something already? Awesome. <laughs> of course, without styling, this isn't what our table looks like, is it? This is the, the default, this is just the default browser CSS. Sorry. Without styling, this isn't what our table looks like. With just the default browser CSS, our table looks like this. The default styles are very basic, and this is much less readable than what we were looking at a minute ago. So before we talk about how to style a table, let's talk about what makes a table well-styled and easy to read. First, provide a caption. Seriously, let your users know what they're looking at. Don't rely on them to read the intro on the paragraph preceding the table. We all know users don't read. Identify the columns, rows, and headers. 
This doesn't mean they each have to have their own background color and end up fighting for visual attention. Often you can use white space to achieve one or more of these effects. Enhance readability the same way you would on other text content. Left align text, and for numbers, right align them and use a monospace font. Group similar data together, like the hockey table does, by grouping goals, assists, and points together. And finally, use smart defaults. Sort the data and identify how the data was sorted to your users. I'm sorry to sound like a first-year design instructor, but the techniques that we're going to use to achieve this really boil down to contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Starting out with font face and link colors inherited from our site defaults, we increase the contrast on the text to differentiate the header and footer from the body, and add a slight contrast in background color to differentiate the rows from each other. I've also added slight contrast on the points column to show that it's the column that the data is sorted on. For repetition, I repeated the header and footer styles to show that they're summary data and bookend the tables. For alignment, the left aligned text and right aligned numbers are easier to scan. And I'm using proximity between the table and caption to create an association between the two and a lack of proximity in the form of white space to communicate where the columns are. White space for the win. There's a temptation to add and add and add to styles when trying to communicate with the table, but often the solution is removing styles. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful, says John Medea, designer. And white space can be your friend. Here is a GIF of all the techniques I just outlined at work. The transformation is quite dramatic, and it shows very well how white space can communicate better than color. So watch this while I take a drink of water. I summarized all these concepts from three articles. They're super in-depth and simply fantastic. You should totally go read them. The last link here is the slide deck that goes along with the animated GIF I just played. These links are also posted on my blog underneath the very long post on Google Analytics and user privacy. I'm just going to ramble for another minute while anyone who wants a photo takes a photo. OK, awesome. Great, we're done with the design advice. Let's talk about how we're going to make that design a reality, starting with a few table-specific CSS properties. Border collapse and border spacing only apply to table elements, and they work together. Border collapse declares whether or not there should be space between borders on cells and the parent table. Border spacing declares how much space there should be. By default, they look something like this. Increasing border spacing increases the spaces between the cells, and switching to border collapse, collapse, removes the space altogether. We don't even end up with borders that rest against each other. They're collapsed down into the same border. By the way, if you want to put borders on your table row elements, it will only work if you collapse the borders. Caption side is another table-specific property, yet it goes on the table element, not the caption element. Caption side places the caption relative to the table. The default value is top, which is pretty straightforward but you can also change it to top outside to have it wider than the table, bottom or bottom outside, or you can put it on the left or the right. That usually requires a little bit of extra styling, though. The last table-specific CSS property you might find useful when styling your tables is vertical align. Vertical align can go on the TH or the TD elements and will align the cell content to the top, middle, or bottom, depending on what you specify. Yes, this is vertical content centering. Yes, you can use it with display table to visually center content on elements other than tables. That's it for special properties, but you can also apply all of the usual ones. 
If we've structured our table well and have lots of different ways of targeting the elements we want to style, I like to work by defining general element styles first and overriding them with more specific declarations. Unfortunately, this doesn't work with columns. Columns could be really cool. They could be awesome, but they're one of those features that the browser vendors decided were like done enough and then went on to the next cool thing. Columns only support three properties, width, background, color, and color. They don't support other useful stuff like text align, border, or font family. And we can't combine classes on columns with anything in the declaration. So for example, you can't target only the table data elements in a column. And any other rule will always override column rules regardless of the specificity. The only thing I've ever used columns for successfully is putting background color on them. But even then, you may find nth child more reliable. I use nth child a lot for styling tables. I think Mike covered these pretty well in his talk about the pseudo classes. Um, here I'm using nth child 5 to target the points column. Or you can use uh, nth child even to do alternating row colors. This is also sometimes called zebra striping, if you're trying to Google it later. Before we stop talking about styles, I need to give you a note about screen readers. When the web was young, we didn't have CSS, and people used tables for layouts. Don't do that. They were desperate times. But because of this, the screen readers try to be smart and guess whether or not a table is being used for layout or displaying data. If you have no headings in your table, and why would you have no headings in your table? that is, no T head and no TH elements, and you remove all the borders from your table with CSS, screen readers will pretend you've marked the whole thing up in span tags for the purposes of reading it out. This will make it much harder for your users to navigate around the data. But seriously, why would you have no headings in your tables? So finally, how can we combine what we've learned to adapt our tables to the small screen? The first option is to shrink the content. This might mean using abbreviations or icons to change units so you can include fewer zeros on big numbers. Here's the hockey table with abbreviations for the headings and player positions. I wouldn't necessarily take this approach with just any table, but hockey fans are familiar with these abbreviations and could read this just fine. Swapping out the browser names for icons on this table gains us a little bit of extra space. And this price index can save space by listing prices in thousands of dollars. The next technique is to linearize your data, changing it to take up more vertical space and less horizontal space. You can do that by repeating the headers for each row, like in this example with our hockey data, or without headers if your data supports it. This table of expenses is understandable, even without the headings repeated. You can also remove data from your tables on smaller screens. The easiest way to do this is to give your users no choice about it. Here, I've removed the position and the penalty minutes. This could be potentially really frustrating for our users, too. So this life tracker shrinks down to one column, but offers its users the choice of what data to see. Using a select box, users can toggle from tracking one metric to another. If the table really, really can't be altered, you can display the entire thing and provide user interface elements to let the user scroll around the full table. The easiest way to do this is to just not hide horizontal overflow on your site. Maybe it doesn't look as slick as some of the other examples, but this is perfectly readable and fully functional. You can also put the entire table in a size, a size constrained container and let the user scroll around. This is the Wikipedia approach. Sorry, I can't see if the slides are playing on my monitor. Did it play? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is the Wikipedia approach. Uh, it's good for large institutional sites that use a content management system where you can't give every single table individual attention. Because this more or less works no matter what the content of the table is. You can also put the entire table in a site. Mm, that's the same slide. You can also get fancy and make the headings sticky, like this Zurb Foundation plugin does. Finally, you can replace the table entirely with something else, either a textual summary of the data, re repeating the relevant points, or a visual representation of the data, like a chart or a graph.
this huge table of numbers gets a lot smaller in graph format. Of course, when we do this, we also lose a lot of the precision in the data, and subtle differences are lost altogether. If you want to get really fancy, you can combine any of the above techniques. This jQuery plugin foo table will remove columns, but reveal their contents if you interact with the remaining data. It's a combination of removing data and linearizing the data. So there you have it. That's how you make your table smaller. In the few minutes I have left, I wanted to show you a table that I worked on recently. This is what the compatibility tables look like on MDN at the moment. And here's the mobile version. It shrinks down to a whole 570 pixels. Now, this is all to totally hypothetical. There's a lot of stuff to do on MDN, and this is near the middle of a pretty long list. But join me in this fantasy. Starting over from scratch and thinking about what's important to people who are coming to this page, there's a few changes that I'd like to make. These days, mobile is just as important to desktop, so I'd give that more prominence. There's also a lot of clutter in those table cells. I'd like to reduce it to just the support information. And I don't think anyone cares about the version of the rendering engine anymore. We all go by browser name these days, so that's all I'd include. Here's my shiny new HTML. It's very similar markup to what I had for the hockey table, with headings along the top and left side. But I actually have two rows of headings in my T head. My headings have headings, since they're each divided into desktop and mobile categories. Those heading headings go in a row above the browser names, and each span the number of columns equal to the number of browsers in that category. I'd also like to point out that this data makes sense without any styling. I'm going to add color to it later to help with comprehension. But colorblind users or users with high contrast themes aren't going to have any trouble understanding it without the color. After we add the color and inherit some of the defaults, this starts to look like a regular old table. It was pretty big, and I was already short on space, so I switched to icons for the browser names right off the bat. The first breakpoint for this data is at 800 pixels, where I linearize just the left size headings. This is done through judicious use of Flexbox. For the five of you who understand Flexbox without a reference guide, basically, I made the T body's flex direction column, and each table row wraps, with the row headings taking up the full width and pushing the cells to the next line, where they all stretch to take up an equal amount of space. The only catch was that the TH and TD elements did not start acting like flex items until I th threw the display block on them. The next breakpoint for this table is 480 pixels, where I made this support data linear and repeated the headings. I also removed the data until the, heading interacts with, until the user interacts with the heading corresponding to the row content. This version was much easier. I overwrote the flex block decorations with a boring old display block and added the headings with liberal youth of inch child. The visibility toggle is pretty simple JavaScript, um, which I made sure was touch and keyboard accessible. This is definitely a hand-tailored solution, specifically for tables of this type. But these tables are on nearly every page of our website, and they contain some of the most important information we provide. So I think it's worthwhile to invest time in the code and really get it right, rather than just using a framework or plugin. People can tell when you've taken the time to do it right. So to summarize, Use tables only when you have appropriate content. Content your users might want to sort, compare, cross-reference, or make calculations with. Make good use of the variety of semantic elements when you're marking up your table before you even start styling it. Use as much white space and as little else as you can to communicate headers, rows, and columns to your users. Grouping similar data and providing smart defaults based on your content and what your users might want to get out of it. And finally, when it comes time to make it fit on small screens, rely on conventions like icons, units, and abbreviations to shrink your content. Rearrange your content to take advantage of the vertical space available. And if all else fails, remove data or provide an interface to let your users navigate the full-size table. So the next time you want to flip a table, I hope you stick the landing. My name is Stephanie Hobson, and I like to make websites everyone can use. Awesome.